Number 30, Season 4, Episode 3, I'm on my own path. Rebecca decides to give up the lawyer lifestyle and try something else. For now, that something else is running a pretzel stand. Some of those pretzels break out into song. The late, brilliant Adam Schlesinger lends his voice to two pretzels with eensy little Simon and Garfunkel wigs and pretty little Simon and Garfunkel harmonies for our twisted fate, their lament about being chosen as Rebecca's life symbol. It's amazing. The other song in this episode is The Banger, Don't Be a Lawyer, which finally gives Jim, played by Burl Mosley, a solo number, and turns out he kicks so much ass. The baggy neon suits and the stellar throwback dancing complement the catchiness. Seriously, this choreo is glorious. Cat M. Burns went off here. I do have to push back against one thing that happens in this episode. Rebecca runs into Josh while he's waiting for his therapy appointment with Dr. Manicopian and apologizes for her previous behavior, saying that what she did to him was some of the worst stuff she's done to anybody. And the writers have Josh immediately say, well, I gaslighted you when we lived together. So they both agree, we both did some bad stuff. Um, Josh just acted like he didn't actually live at Rebecca's house and, yeah, stood her up at their wedding. Rebecca put hits out on his family, stalked him, threatened his mother, got him permanently suspended from Aloha Tech, stalked his girlfriend and ran over her cat, manipulated him, gaslighted him. I could go on. It would have been nice to see Josh get to sit with Rebecca's apology without having to offer one of his own. Back to the good stuff. Also in this episode, our random quirky queen, Heather, decides to marry her boyfriend, Hector, so he can get on her health insurance because she just does things like get married and agree to carry Daryl's baby, just like on fun whims. But unlike the pregnancy storyline, we actually see this decision play out in real time, including how upset Hector gets when such an important life moment is rushed along like that. How often do we get to see a male character care about weddings and ceremonies without being made fun of? So Heather agrees to do a whole traditional wedding where Rebecca actually makes a moment not all about her and most importantly, to my tear ducts at least, Heather walks down the aisle to a stirring instrumental rendition of The Moment Is Me. Bear us this twisted face. Number 29, season three, episode five, I Never Want to See Josh Again. I will be discussing suicide during this portion of the video. To skip past that content, jump to this time. 4.08. Rebecca's back at home with her mother, having burned her last bridge in West Covina, and Naomi's her usual abrasive self, nagging Rebecca for lying around in bed all day and criticizing the depression frizz in her hair. But Rebecca is strangely acquiescent. This leads Naomi to check Rebecca's laptop, where she finds a list of the nine least painful ways to kill yourself that Rebecca's been researching. It's obvious that Rebecca's been backsliding, but this brings it home in such a hideously real way. Her mental illness isn't just quirky, a little spooky, or even the thing that destroyed her relationships. It's the thing that might kill her because she's never gotten a handle on it. Naomi's best course of action, at least in her mind, is to start drugging her daughter by grinding up anxiety pills and strawberry milkshakes, which Rebecca reluctantly accepts. I always like shows where both of the characters in a conflict are allowed to be right, and when Rebecca finds out and confronts her mother, I think there's a lot of value in what Naomi says. They've been through this before, and she doesn't know any other way to help the daughter that she loves. But Rebecca's also totally right to be freaked out by this obvious breach in consent, and to feel like she's lost her last safe space. Rebecca gets on a plane to, well, she doesn't care. She's too tired to switch tickets, to change her life again, to face reality. A kind flight attendant offers her the only thing she can, a glass of red wine, which Rebecca uses to swallow all of Naomi's anxiety medication that she's stolen. But the flight attendant actually offers Rebecca much more than the wine. She offers her kindness, and in the last few seconds of the episode, as the sign above Rebecca changes from help to hope, a tether to life. This whole show is about women lifting each other up from their circumstances, and while there was no need for this flight attendant to be this kind to an obviously distraught passenger, she was. She gave a listening ear, a glass of red wine, and hope, and as the episode ends, we as the audience can only hold our breaths to see if that was enough. On the lighter side, everyone back in West Covina, reeling from Rebecca's absence, use a new lawyer as their scapegoat for their feelings. The new lawyer is brisk, business-like, and almost too professional, but she does get a little song all to herself where she shimmies with a bartender. It feels really weird to quantify this episode with a ranking, so I just put it here. Number 28, Season 4, Episode 15, I Need to Find My Frenemy. Each member of Girl Group Forever is dealing with a mini personal crisis. If only there was a convenient distraction in the form of needing to go to Las Vegas to collect Rebecca's arch nemesis, Audra Levine, who has abandoned her husband and newborn triplets. Wee! All the stuff in Vegas is great. Slow motion and its various short reprises are hilarious, and I wish we had a thousand more songs featuring Girl Group Forever's sick harmonies. I especially laugh at Valencia shouting, yes! 
and Heather showering the group with Cheetos while they watch Paula crush a poker game in slow motion. Plus, I think it's really smart that the show has Audra Levine, who always represented the lifestyle that Rebecca could never live up to, tell Rebecca that she actually made this escape to Vegas because she was following Rebecca's example. From the outside, Rebecca's refusal to live the life that her mother created for her, her whimsical trip to tropical shores, her cute pretzel business, and her overflowing love life seems like a dream, but we, who have followed Rebecca through it all, know that it's anything but. Like Trent before her, Audra represents Rebecca's foil, the Rebecca we knew in episode one, who would tell anyone and everyone that she's not crazy, because when you call her crazy, you're just calling her in love. Rachel Great is excellent as Audra in this episode, giving her a depth we've never seen before as she skirts the edge of mania. Plus, the two rivals share a reprise of their rap battle from season one, and this one is studded with even more clever Yiddish turns of phrase and Rebecca's breakdown of the term Jewish American princess directly to the camera, while Audra does her best to figure out the sudden new focal point. It's really good. Yep. Number 27, season three, episode 13, Nathaniel is irrelevant. Heather finally delivers Daryl and Rebecca's Franken-baby. To help her through it, Paula sings The Miracle of Birth, which is genuinely one of the grossest songs I've ever heard. Donna Lynn sounds like an angel as she sings about bloody mucus plugs. I made the horrible decision to eat ramen while I watched this episode, and I actually had to put down my chopsticks and sit back for a few minutes because I started to feel so ill, which is a pretty high compliment. The other main storyline in this episode follows Rebecca's feelings of guilt, which have been manifesting as Swim Chan-esque visions of Trent. Except, like the guilt, Trent is real, and he wants to hurt her like she's hurt him by targeting something she loves, Nathaniel. So, Rebecca storms into Nathaniel's rooftop party and pushes Trent off the edge of the roof after he holds a knife to Nathaniel. But Rebecca's done so many horrible things to so many people that the only person who truly believes this story is Nathaniel, who tells her to plead insanity in order to avoid a conviction. Rebecca and Nathaniel sing, nothing is ever anyone's fault because we're all the product of the messed up things our parents did to us and you know, we're all going through a tough times. so how can anyone be held accountable for anything we've ever done, really? This isn't one of my favorite songs, maybe because the camera work is just spin around Nathaniel and Rebecca, but I do think it's smart what Nathaniel's trying to convey to Rebecca. Look how easy it is not to take responsibility. It's a message that's been guiding her for her entire time in West Covina that's been bothering so many viewers, even hardcore fans of the show. How much of Rebecca's behavior are the other characters, and by extension us, supposed to tolerate? Yes, she just got a diagnosis of BPD, but is the show really gonna let her use that as an excuse for everything? It turns out, during the emotional last three minutes of the season, that it's not. Rebecca says that she's always let her mother, or love, or life in general guide her, pretending that she didn't have a say in the matter, but she did. And she does. So Rebecca pleads guilty, and the last shot of the season is her, fresh-faced with a slight smile, gazing at Paula as she takes responsibility for the first time. It's powerful, it's so needed, and it's one of the most impactful moments of the show. Number 26, Season 1, Episode 4. I'm going on a date with Josh's friend! Here's one of the first times Rebecca tries to turn her life around and make healthy decisions. One of those healthy decisions might just be to date Greg instead of spending all her time pining for Josh. And so, therefore, we get the unforgettable black and white classic Hollywood song and dance number, Settle For Me, which is a treat on so many levels. For the first time, we get to see both Greg and Rebecca's real dancing chops, and while it's funny to see Rebecca joke about not being able to do body rolls, it's also a delight to see Rachel Bloom show off her actual talent on the dance floor. My quadruple threat queen. Rebecca has a wonderful time on her date with Greg, of course, because oh my gosh, their chemistry, but then decides, well, in a porta potty, to take home some other guy and hook up with him instead. Although it makes sense later, impulsivity, especially sexual impulsivity, is a big part of her diagnosis, it does not feel good to watch Greg go through this. The other main song here, Sex with a Stranger, is about Tinder hookups. It's great. Not necessarily great enough that I want to endure Greg's rejection for a dozen rewatches, but there's something so earwormy about the way Rachel Bloom sings. Number 25, Season 4, Episode 13. I Have To Get Out. Most of I Have To Get Out takes place at the hospital, where just about everybody has something going on. Heart attack recovery, falling asleep on a gurney, contracting squirrel flu. That's a lot, but almost all of it lands. The only thing I strongly dislike is the fact that the bearer of the squirrel flu is literally named Little Cough Boy and calls himself in the third person Little Cough Boy. Some good stuff. The rising tension between Greg and Josh in the quarantine room, with Nathaniel desperately trying to keep the peace between them. He doesn't succeed, and they fight, but real-life fighting is awkward. 
If I have to pick a favorite part, it's when Greg and Josh are doing their best West Side Story choreography, only to get interrupted by real-life, non-awkward choreographer Kat M. Burns. It's such fun. But the best stuff of all is the first song in the episode. Antidepressants are so not a big deal. If you listen to no other song from this show, please make it this one. A La La Land style big show stopper with a full tap dancing ensemble and Michael Hyatt serving notes and moves. Plus, eagle-eyed viewers might catch that the happy homemakers featured in this song are, in fact, Josh's sister Jema and her husband who got married at the end of season one. And the grocery clerk is Allie, who recently had her engagement party at home base. Antidepressants are so common that even tiny side characters are taking them. Rebecca doesn't need to feel like she's weak for accepting help in the form of medication. The message of the song is incredible. The dancing is stellar. The live version from the Crazy Ex-Girlfriend concert experience is also amazing. And please check it out if you can, just to see the whole damn cast tearing up the stage with tap dancing. It's glorious. There's a reason it won an Emmy for not only the music and lyrics, but for Kat M. Burns' unstoppable choreography. Our lawyers won't let us say brand names. Number 24, season one, episode 18. Paula needs to get over Josh. Paula, who just discovered Rebecca's been lying to her about sleeping with Greg, chastises Rebecca for throwing away all her efforts to get her together with Josh. She does this by singing her take on Rose's turn, and once again, Donalyn Champlin proves her skill by belting for the gods. This song is a killer, and I know because I once recorded a cover of it for YouTube that immediately got two dislikes and so I took it down. <laughs> After their best friendship explodes, Rebecca puts all of her eggs in Greg's basket. She has discovered that she really does feel deeply for him, and she can't wait to declare her feelings in one perfect romantic moment. Except that's probably not gonna happen because as Greg's closest friends tell her, this is Greg she's talking about, sarcastic, alcoholic Greg, it feels so bad to watch him live up exactly to his friends' low expectations of him. This episode is so well written and so uncomfortable. Every fiber of my being wishes that the whole fake being cool so you don't chase away your crush thing wasn't part of our social vernacular. Rebecca's really trying to be mature and for once she's tempering her expectations. Yes, she wants a huge fairy tale moment of romance, but by the end of a night with Greg, she'll settle for him farting while he tells her what he's feeling. And he still can't do that. This little too cool game ends up with Greg drunk at Josh's sister's wedding and Rebecca running off with Josh, who's willing to give her the attention she needs. They make love on the hood of a convertible that magically transforms into a flying carpet. She caresses his hairless arms. But the show is too smart to let that be the end of the season. The very last thing that happens is that Rebecca, in a post-coital glow, confesses to Josh that, yep, she moved to West Covina for him and she's been in love with him all along. The first time I saw that, I'm pretty sure I swallowed my own tongue and immediately hit play on the next season to see what would happen next. Also, Leah Solanga, aka Mulan, and Jasmine sings One Indescribable Instant, a gorgeous tune ostensibly from Rebecca's favorite romantic fairy tale, Slumbered. The mention of the movie and the flashbacks to younger Rebecca feel shoehorned in, but I'll take any excuse to hear Leah Perfect Pitch Solanga sing a princess song. And holy cow, is it beautiful. <laughs> Number 23, Season 1, Episode 5, Josh and I are good people. Rebecca has unwittingly turned sarcastic, sexy bartender Greg into her moral arbiter in West Covina and for some reason needs him to think she's a good person. Which he doesn't because she abandoned him on their date to sleep with a different guy just like one episode ago. <laughs> this is an episode with some great firsts. We first meet the great father Bra, played with hilarious chill by lead script supervisor and professionally handsome Renee Goob, and Daryl gets his big first musical number, I Love My Daughter, but not in a creepy way. Which probably doesn't top anybody's list of favorite songs in the show, but Pete Gardner really just sings the hell out of it and sells the whole thing. There's also the uber catchy I'm a good person, which probably would end up on that list I just mentioned. It's impossible not to get the song stuck in your head for weeks afterwards, and Rachel Bloom shows off both her squeaky, ingratiating baby voice and her deep, threatening growl. And her cute little bike shorts underneath her dress. Paula is basically still an over-the-top cartoon villain at this point, which makes me not love this episode quite as much as her later, more mature ones, and some of the bits with Daryl's daughter Madison are awkward, but come on, say it. Say this is a good episode or I'll gut you like a fish. You're a good person! Oh, thank you! Number 22, Season 2, Episode 6. Who needs Josh when you have a girl group? 
This episode parodies R. Kelly's epic, multi-part, weird, weird song, Trapped in the Closet, as Paula becomes stuck in the bathroom at Rebecca and Heather's new place, which is where all those drug dealers got mur- Hey, are those other plot points to talk about? Setting aside paying homage to just one of the worst dudes ever, this episode has a lot going for it. It somehow finds a way to get Paula, who's been spending all her time with her new friend Sunil, together with Rebecca. But also Sunil's there, and also Valencia and Heather, but then Daryl and Maya burst in, but Karen from The Office is also there, dressed in a cat suit, and by the way, Trent shows up. I don't really need a good reason to shove all these people together, I just love that they are, because the ensuing drama is so good. The moment we've been waiting for has arrived, when Paula finally calls out Rebecca for her selfishness, and boy is it cathartic. Sometimes different groups of friends, especially groups of gal pals, don't seamlessly gel, and that can be hard. There's a complicated jealousy with female friendships that this show just nails. Less complicated is the plan for Rebecca's new girl group to take over the world, which they'll accomplish in their friend Topia, which starts out the episode on a high note before all the drama. This is basically a Spice Girls song, and I could listen to it on a loop-de-loop -loop where it ends at the start and starts at the end because it's just that good. And who doesn't love Valencia? The sexy one, czar of torture. And oh yeah, Trent is back. God, he's weird. Paul Welsh seems to have an exact sixth sense for how to make his Ken doll-like features distort in uncanny ways. He's following in season one Rebecca's footsteps, attempting to infiltrate a friend group to get closer to her. He also lifts the fallen ceiling pieces out of the way so Paula can escape the bathroom, which earns him enough cred with Rebecca that she sleeps with him. Huge shout out to a visual gag I just noticed. In the previous episode, Rebecca says that she has a fetish for having red licorice during sex, and then after she's done with Trent, we see a piece of red licorice in her hand. <laughs> He's so normal. I'm in love. Number 21. Season 3, episode 12. Trent? Trent is back in a big way, just when Rebecca has decided to settle down to a life of singledom. But how can she be single when Trent's blackmailing her so she'll be his girlfriend? This Trent appearance includes both a truly unhinged recap of what he's been doing for the past year or so, and a more subtle, nuanced moment where he tells Rebecca that of course he's still pursuing her, because she's been confusing him this whole time, blowing hot and cold, letting him cook and clean for her, taking his virginity, and then demanding he get out of her life. Yes, of course he's being so creepy, and Rebecca owes him nothing, but that's once again a brilliant way to flip Rebecca's own story on its head. Rebecca did the same stuff to Josh, and we were supposed to admire her for it. Now that she's progressed in her therapy journey, she can't tolerate that behavior from Trent because it's too much like how she used to be. Also, I'm Just a Boy in Love, Trent's version of the season two theme song is so damn good. Trent's little heart-studded suit, amazing. Shout out again to costume designer Melina Root. Another song in this episode is the purely joyful buttload of cats, or the more explicit version, a fuck ton of cats, which sees Rebecca collabing with a chorus of puppet cats. Adorable. And then we beat on the Atlantic. Number 20, season two, episode 10. Will Scarsdale like Josh's Shayna Punham? Shayna Punham is Yiddish for pretty face. Anyway, Rebecca brings Josh home to Scarsdale for a cousin's bar mitzvah. He feels some trepidation about the trip, knowing about Rebecca's tough relationship with her mother, but she's sure she'll be completely unbothered because love will protect her. After all, thanks to love, we'll never have problems again. This is a fine disco number that includes just a truly endearing soul train from Heather, the lone voice of reason constantly confronted by Josh and Rebecca's over-the-top love. Much to Rebecca's shock and disquiet, Josh bonds with her mother and has a blast in Scarsdale. She grows more uncomfortable during the bar mitzvah, which features a truly fantastic song, Remember That We Suffered, sung by her mother and Patty Lipone, who hilariously sucks air during her verse like a scuba diver finally emerging to the surface, when we all know she could sustain her notes until the heat death of the universe. <gasps> This episode concludes with just a wonderful, hilarious encounter in Dr. Akopian's office. Rebecca is finally starting to realize that Josh can't solve her misery, and neither could Greg, so maybe it's not about any man. Maybe she needs to work on herself? And then Josh bursts in and proposes and ruins everything. Yes! No! <laughs> Number 19, Season 1, Episode 11. That text was not meant for Josh! Rebecca accidentally texted Josh instead of Paula, and what she sent, well, she's basically confessing her love and the fact that she moved to West Covina for him. It's a text emergency, or is it a textastrophe? A group of 80s hairband lawyers are here to act like a Greek chorus, narrating her actions while squabbling over what to call Rebecca's situation. 
They add so much life and character to this episode that otherwise feels claustrophobic and really intense. But enough about the parts of the episode that aren't, you stupid bitch, because this song is a triumph. Before it became slightly memed to death, it was the first song in the show that really hit me in the gut. Yes, we've seen Rebecca break down before, sob in front of a bunch of girls at camp, eat pills off the floor, and generally be unhinged, but this is the first time that her self-loathing is so at the forefront that you can't look away from it. It's not funny any longer. You realize as her voice breaks while she calls herself horrible, stupid, dumb, and ugly, and stupid, that she really genuinely loathes herself. And there's a moment where she begs Greg to stay with her in her apartment full of broken glass. First time viewers might think she's just doing her usual Rebecca thing, avoiding her problems by seeking male attention, but if you know this show, you know that she's actually begging somebody to keep her from being alone with these sharp shards of glass, which she very well might use to hurt herself if she's left unsupervised. This is the first time the crazy in Crazy Ex-Girlfriend feels really real for Rebecca and for those of us watching. That song and that moment signals a tone change for the show. No matter what goofy things Rebecca gets into from here on out, we know something deeper about her because this song just pulled back the curtain for a few moments and no matter how Rebecca tries, it can't be put back. Yes, I deserve this! Number 18, Season 1, Episode 6, My First Thanksgiving with Josh! Through Paula's machinations, Rebecca receives an invitation from Josh's mother, Lourdes, to join the Chan fam for Thanksgiving. Of course, Rebecca throws herself into this task, learning introductory Tagalog, cooking traditional Filipino dishes, and lecturing everyone else on their cultural insensitivity. This is a really, really good episode. There are only two songs, but first, I Give Good Parent is incredible. I mean, Amy Hill wearing a grill, Rebecca's backup dancers being Jema and Justinity, Josh's sisters, Rebecca rapping Got the Chan Fam Damp in Their Underpants, and it's one of the catchiest tunes from the whole series. And of course, Greg sings the beautiful What'll It Be, one of Adam Schlesinger's most haunting tunes from the show, and another chance for Santino Fontana to show off his silky smooth voice. I can't even tell you what my favorite part of the song is. Is it the lyrics? Hands are sorta of gross, it's hard to explain. Is it Greg providing his own vocalized drum fill? This episode also concludes with a genuinely sweet moment between Greg and Rebecca. I just got burned from watching all this sizzling chemistry. Din din, yes, for the win, yes. Number 17, Season 1, Episode 3. I hope Josh comes to my party. Rebecca grapples with her party-related trauma in order to host a shindig at her new West Covina apartment, definitely not just as an excuse to spend more time with Josh. This episode is the first appearance of the bright Ava Akers as young Rebecca. They look so alike, and Ava does a wonderful job at copying Rachel Bloom's mannerisms to paint a clear picture of how she was uh, pretty much always like this. All three songs in this episode are winners. Donalyn Champlin's musical theater background really shines for the first time with Face Your Fears, a way over the top number that encourages Rebecca to run with scissors and fly off a building before joining the Marines. There's even a children's choir singing School is Stupid in perfect harmony. I Have Friends is sung by both young and current Rebecca, and it's a bubblegum bop that has me occasionally shouting Grocery clerk with half an eyelid. It also encapsulates one of the most important themes of the show, Rebecca's earnest struggle to create real relationships, and I love that the refrain appears in the background many times later, whenever Rebecca is trying and likely failing to establish a connection with another person. A boy band made up of four Joshes is also awesome. Vinny Rodriguez III is such an animated performer that quadruple Drupaling him was only ever going to be a great time. And I love that Rebecca gets to hug her younger self during this performance, showing that most of her motivation to keep pursuing Josh is really just to heal her inner child, who is still pining for the boy she knew at camp and the father who abandoned her. If you're trying to convince someone to watch this series, this is a great episode to show them. Fly out of a window. Who are you singing to? Number 16, Season 1, Episode 15. Josh has no idea where I am. Love doesn't have to be a person. It can be a passion. And that passion has sustained you for much of your life, hasn't it? Love comes in different forms. You know, Rebecca, maybe it's not that you don't have love in your life. Maybe it's that you don't recognize it when it's there. As an asexual person who absolutely adores the theater, I can't tell you how much of an impact this episode has on me and to the ending of the show as a whole. While trapped on a plane with Dr. Ecopian, or is it the other way around? Rebecca falls asleep and actually starts doing some therapy work by diving into her past. 
Dr. Ecopian dispenses wisdom, suggesting to Rebecca that maybe her great love isn't a man after all, and although Rebecca isn't yet ready to take all these lessons to heart, to really hear them, I'm really hearing them. I'm also really hearing Dream Ghost, which features Ricky Lake, aka the original Tracy Turnblad from Hairspray, and Amber Riley, aka Mercedes from Glee, one of my faves. Hard to believe that this advice from Dream Ghost to Copian only really comes back in the final season, but the seeds are planted, and oh, what seeds they are. Do you know how hard it is to pass a Bechtel test when you're a Dream Ghost? Number 15, Season 2, Episode 11. Josh is the man of my dreams, right? The Santa Ana winds have taken over West Covina, causing sexy dreams, paperwork destroying gusts, and generally just making things weird. If you haven't seen much of Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, there's still a chance that you know this episode because it's one of the most memorable and tonally distinct ones of the whole series. It's also a heck of a lot of fun. The Santa Ana winds are personified by a weatherman doing an uncanny Frankie Valley impersonation. Is it a little goofy watching him wave his fingers around to create magic dust that flies into Rebecca's nose, prompting her to dream about Nathaniel? Yeah, but that goofiness is the foundation of the show. Remember the posters coming to life in the very first episode? It's a treat to watch that kind of magical realism come back, especially because it leads to some of the best moments of the whole season. Paula finally calls Daryl out for constantly claiming to be her best friend, and he responds with the very sweet, you're my best friend and I know I'm not yours, and it's okay. Wait, what am I saying? It's great. And now I get to talk about Let's Have Intercourse. Rebecca and Nathaniel are stuck in an elevator together, and unfortunately, Nathaniel wants to have sex with Rebecca. God, this song is great. It's a pitch-perfect clone of Ed Sheeran's Thinking Out Loud, and it includes some of the best lines, delivery, and dancing of anything since, well, since Santino Fontana left the show. Rebecca wears a gorgeous, gauzy pink dress, and Nathaniel twirls her through the air, and he also sings about wanting to know what her nipples look like. It's just genius on every level. This episode is just so iconic and just a delight. Another one you could show to any friend to convince them to watch. And you'll hopefully go back to seeming weird to me. Number 14, season two, episode one. Where is Josh's friend? Picking up 15 minutes after season one left off, season two begins with a shell-shocked Josh driving Rebecca home from his sister's wedding. He tries to get straight answers from Rebecca about her confession that she moved to West Covina for him and is ready to begin their love story, and she gaslights him until the point he apologizes to her for acting crazy. So yeah, season two immediately brings Rebecca's antics, including manipulation, stalking, and obsession back into full swing. I hope this doesn't sound like I'm encouraging gaslighting, I just mean it's brilliant that even seconds after Rebecca gets what she wanted, she has to scramble to cover up the twisted machinations of her mind because her love story is not that simple love kernels. Although the video ate up their production budget, that led to fantastic visuals, from Rebecca's cactus costume to the popcorn raining down like candy on Shaquille O'Neal in the movie Kazam. How did they get a broom on a stand to look so much like Pete Gardner? The world may never know! Besides the visuals, the content of the song is surprisingly moving. This helped me figure out that I had been accepting love kernels in my own life, trying to string together stray compliments or occasional flirtations into some sort of love story, believing I was undeserving of real love. If you look at the comments on this video on YouTube, lots of people share similar stories and even say that this song helped them get out of dead-end relationships. In case you're wondering, Rebecca and you deserve more than just kernels of love. You deserve the whole bowl. Slurp, slurp. Number 13, Season 2, Episode 4, When Will Josh and His Friend Leave Me Alone? Greg takes off to his new life at Emory University, which sends Rebecca into a spiral. If Josh and Greg both left her, and she doesn't know who she is without them, then who can she be now? She could try being herself, but- What? Who? No! Ew! Before original Greg leaves, he gets two final numbers. It was a shit show, and we tapped that ass. Although the former is a lovely, slow ballad where Greg confesses his love to Rebecca and simultaneously acknowledges the dumpster fire that their relationship was, it's neutered by the censoring of the main word in the title. The CW wouldn't allow the S word, so Greg's mouth is blurred and the word is beeped. Watch it on YouTube for the full effect. Then Santino and Vinny bust out their tap dancing chops to the most innuendo-laden tune the show's yet had. We hit the back patio. That's why we hit your back patio! Bonus points for the cameo from the vegan man bun guy that Rebecca left her date with Greg for. I especially have to give a nod to Paula's storyline in this episode. She struggles with the idea of bringing a new baby into the chaos of her life and decides to decline her chance at law school. Then, after nailing a presentation for a client, she reconsiders and goes ahead and terminates the pregnancy. 
As Paula herself says at the beginning of the episode, options are for teenagers a month after the winter formal, which is what makes it so refreshing to see an older woman who already has a family choosing termination, a storyline hardly ever played out on network TV. It's very sad to say goodbye to Santino, but this episode provides a beautiful send-off for him along with some other great stuff. But where should we finish? Please not on my chest. Number 12, season 4, episode 16, I Have a Date Tonight. Everybody shut up! White Josh has a solo! Love's Not a Game is my absolute favorite group number from the show. Everyone has gathered at home base to place bets on who they think will win Rebecca's heart. White Josh arrives and begins to chastise everybody. After all, he's the judgy one. No way he'd get into this. He's too uptight to care about his friends' love lives. JK LOL! Thank God he's in the mood to wear a cool fedora, because that leads us into this incredible number with appearances from just about every character we've ever met and loved on the show. Even Father Bra stops by to give his counsel as a graduate of preschool. Preschool? No, preschool. Donna Lynn finally gets to show off her incredible tap dancing skills, and everybody wears suspenders and fedoras and prances around doing amazing choreography. This is so fun to watch, super catchy, and an excellent send off to the supporting characters. Also, Weird Al shows up to sing There's No Bathroom and Shred on the accordion. <laughs> now let's talk about these three dates. Do I think the situation would ever occur or even should occur? No. If I were Josh, Rebecca's actions during the Swim Chain episode would be unforgivable. If I were Greg, I would not be able to get over the fact that she slept with my dad. As far as I'm concerned, Nathaniel is the only viable option of the three. But that doesn't stop me from tearing up during every damn date in this episode. Josh setting up a tent and a fire pit in their shared courtyard, then projecting a constellation of stars just for Rebecca, and watching her instead of the stars, and saying he'll always find his way home to her crying. Nathaniel and Rebecca dancing to the funk music that was actually supposed to be Broadway's greatest hits, then Nathaniel pulling her close and saying, I thought so when she kisses him passionately, shivering. And oh my god, this long shot that slowly pulls away from Rebecca and Greg, doing nothing more exciting than picking out what they'll eat for dinner, that ends with Greg saying, you're the love of my life, you know that right, and Rebecca answering, well I do now, screaming! Please don't poop in my balloon. Number 11, Season 1, Episode 2, Josh's Girlfriend is Really Cool. Rebecca meets Josh Chan's girlfriend, Valencia. She's tall, thin, impossibly gorgeous, with long, flowing hair and an affinity for drinking boxed water. She also teaches a yoga class. I'm So Good at Yoga is one of the boppiest songs this show ever put forth. Let me remind you, this was the show's second episode. They had no need to go this hard. And yet, here we have Kat M. Burns choreographing a Bollywood-style number with a legion of flexible dancers, including one very impressive pregnant yogi, and Valencia singing about how she kisses her own hoo-ha. Can you do that? Not only is this song S-tier because of its looks and sound, but it hits even harder when you realize that Valencia isn't really like this at all. This is just Rebecca's projection onto her. Real Valencia just requests that Rebecca stay in child's pose if she can't do a headstand. But imaginary Valencia taunts Rebecca for her weight, her fear of clowns and trains, and her father's abandonment. This is the first song in the show that a character who isn't Rebecca sings all on their own, and it sets up the idea that it's going to keep happening as Rebecca projects onto everybody. Brilliant. Also, Gabrielle Ruiz was only ever intended to appear in two episodes, but the production staff was so charmed by her she became a series mainstay, and this episode immediately makes it clear why. The other song, Feeling Kinda Naughty, is a hysterical take on the trope that the writers twisted to perfection. You know, the thing where you meet your crush's crush, and then you start going on and on about how great they are, how hot they are, oh my gosh, your crush should totally ask them out because they'd make a great couple, please put me out of my misery! Somebody in the comments on YouTube said that putting this song in the second episode was a power move, and I completely agree. It's nuts, and so bold to throw into the show less than two hours in, which is one of the things that made me fall in love with this series so immediately. OMG, you look so cute in my skin! Number 10, Season 3, Episode 1, Josh's Ex-Girlfriend Wants Revenge. This is the start of my personal favorite season of Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, Season 3, which begins two weeks after Josh left Rebecca at the altar. Everyone's been hounding Paula for information, but even she hasn't heard from Rebecca. And so the speculation begins in the excellent full ensemble number, Where's Rebecca Bunch? The cast all dons their best corsets and stockings for this gossipy number set in ye old West Covina, where the whole town is a Twitter, cause the whole town is on Twitter. Nobody's heard from Rebecca, but everyone is concerned. Her life got ruined, and so publicly, what is she up to? Rebecca, for her part, has been holed up in a hotel suite for the past two weeks, miserably wondering what her life will become now that her reason for living has abandoned her. 
She finally decides to fight back, to dye her hair a luscious espresso, to paint her nails black, to watch Basic Instinct. She shows back up at work and commandeers the break room to assemble her gal pals and tell them her plan for, as the French would say, revenge, which is to mail Josh her poop. Rebecca's friends are so sure that she has a devious multi-step plan that she'll use her highly educated brain to come up with something to disgrace Josh forever, but all she's got is poop cupcakes. It's obvious that Josh's betrayal knocked her down a few pegs. This comes to full fruition at the stinger to the episode, where Rebecca affixes a label to a container of poop in her bathroom, then stares at herself in the mirror and bursts into maniacal laughter. The stakes just got raised. The end of season two showed us just how unhinged Rebecca can be, and that's already continuing in this season. The brakes on this train are eroding. This episode also contains the absolute S-tier bop, banger, jam, let's generalize about men, which many people rank as their number one song from this show because, yeah, it's just that good. The gaudy neon eyeshadow, the fluorescent 80s power skirt suits, Gabrielle Ruiz busting out that top line, and the clever lyrics make this truly an iconic number. Your sons are gonna be rapists. Number 9. Season 2, Episode 2. When will Josh see how cool I am? Greg comes to terms with being an alcoholic, and he declares that with the great jig, Greg's Drinking Song. Santino Fontana just chews this one up, but the all-male chorus adds a great depth. Meanwhile, Rebecca imagines that Josh imagines that she's so hot while playing ping pong. Just stick with me on this one. For Ping Pong Girl, her imaginary Josh fronts a Green Day-style band who all provide rousing chants of sports and jock itch, along with Josh's testosterone-fueled ditty about Rebecca's skills on the court? which real Rebecca absolutely does not have. So she pays an 11-year-old boy for lessons to try to prove to Josh that she's skilled, all the while ignoring Paula's request for a letter of recommendation for law school. Rebecca's story in this episode is silly, and that's the point. While Paula takes strides towards her dream, more on that in a second, and Greg attends his meetings and starts to make amends, Rebecca's stuck in another stupid scheme to win Josh's attention. Except, she already has him in her living room all the time, playing video games and drinking beer. People are starting to move on from her machinations, and now that she's got Josh, it's becoming clear that he's just another dude. Okay, speaking of Paula's dream, when the second season of the show was announced, the producers asked the stars what type of song they'd like to sing. Donna Lynn requested a Disney princess style number, so here is the sing-songy, absolutely filthy, maybe this dream. This song is super hard. You want to know how I know this? I performed it live for a local variety show after having a cold for a week. It's gorgeously sung, beautifully styled, Jim and Tim appear as backup birds. It's really just amazing. I love the tender hope this song holds. Yes, law school is a big dream, but the real dream is feeling like you deserve to have a dream in the first place. Wonderful stuff. Paula Proctor, how may I help you? Number 8, Season 4, Episode 12, I Need a Break. Rebecca's in a love bubble with Greg. Their relationship is her priority at the moment. She doesn't have time for group therapy or her appointments with Dr. Okopian and Dr. Shin. She's just a girl in love, and she's going to the water park of her dreams with the man of her dreams. And that's why this episode is so brilliant. Everything that happens is a sharp, painful, important deep dive into recovery, mental illness, and therapy in a way I've never seen another TV show address. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go to Raging Waters! And it's no fun. Greg doesn't want to ride any of the slides. He won't do the pose she likes for photos. He even tells her in epic Bruce Springsteen fashion, I hate everything but you. But he doesn't. That's not Greg talking. That's Rebecca imagining Greg talking. Other than Forget It, this is the only song so far in season four that features one character singing to Rebecca alone without her joining in. That means it's not a mutual expression of emotion, it's her projection of his thoughts and feelings. Just like how original Greg never actually told Rebecca, settle for me, new Greg isn't telling her how much he hates stuff. One of the commenters on this track on YouTube mentioned that what Rebecca's doing is called splitting, which is common for people with borderline personality disorder. Splitting means making something all good or all bad, when in reality it's a mix. Credit goes to Rod Van Buren for this insight. Yes, Greg was complaining, but he came along to Raging Waters at Rebecca's request. It just didn't go the way she planned, the way she built it up in her head for years. So she imagines that he's miserable, because she makes him miserable, because she's worthless and everybody hates her, and oh look, a shame spiral. What's a good shame spiral without downing like a billion drinks and proclaiming to the world, oh, I'm not sad, you're sad, while stealing a taco from staff writer Alana Pena? 
Check out this frighteningly well-acted mishmash of emotions searing across Rebecca's face in this one single shot. She's not okay. She's so not okay that she soothes her anger towards Greg by trying to hook up with Nathaniel, who rejects her. So then she tries to hook up with Josh, who rejects her. So then she goes to sleep on the bench outside of Dr. Shin's office? Wait, the last time we saw Rebecca hit rock bottom like this, she slept with Marco, then got on a series of planes before attempting to overdose on pills, but here she makes the decision to go get help, or at least to wait on a bench until help arrives all handsome and doctor-like in the morning. This is not the same Rebecca that we've known, which means she has one more ex to handle. And that ex is the darkness, or you know what, let's call him Tyler. Yeah, that sounds right. This is a love ballad dedicated to depression, Rebecca's constant companion since she was a child. It's also the thing that impacts her enormous mood swings, that keeps her from feeling truly happy, that could be helped if she followed her doctor's advice and took an antidepressant. But how can she give up on the one ex who has loved her the longest? We rarely talk about the fear that if you lose your depression, you might lose something you've associated with yourself for so long that you don't know how to exist without it. The last shot of the episode is Rebecca swallowing her first antidepressant, then placing the cap back on the bottle and setting it down with a placid expression on her face. It's so much subtler than many other moments in the show, but this quiet acquiescence, this silent step back onto the road to recovery, moves me deeply. Number 7. Season 1, Episode 1. Josh just happens to live here! Unlike many shows, where the pilot episode is just something you put on for your friends and then constantly turn to them to say, it gets good in like a few episodes, I promise, this is a really, a really good pilot episode. It sets up five of the major characters. Rebecca is intense and dramatic, but also suffering from multiple mental illnesses as she chases the success her mother insists upon. Josh is easygoing and open, if not a little too childlike and naive. Paula has a tendency to snoop around for information, but mostly because she cares so deeply. Daryl is well-meaning, but unsure of his own place in the world, which leads to a lot of awkwardness. And Greg should be a search term on porn I mean, Greg is sarcastic and snarky, and uses that to mask what a considerate person he is. We get all that from this 45-minute episode, and we also get music. Original music. I had no idea this was a musical when I first turned it on, on a whim, and when Rebecca starts strutting along the streets of New York and singing, I felt the familiar tears spark in my eyes that always spring up whenever I get to experience the joy of musical theater. The very first number, West Covina, is a wonder. It tells us everything we need to know. The song in Rebecca's head can turn the drab, gum-covered sidewalks of West Covina to the sparkle of the concrete ground because this place is her bright, sunny fantasy. And also, Josh just happens to live here. The other major song in this episode is the equally fantastic Sexy Getting Ready song, a Kylie Minogue-esque tune that features several backup dancers performing body rolls, which are really hard, while wearing bleach strips, hair curlers, and spanks. Right away, we see the genius of Rachel Bloom's interpretation of the female experience. Just when you think Rebecca is the most beautiful woman you've ever seen, she rips back the curtain to show off exactly how she gets that way. I will never not laugh at her standing and grooving on her toilet while the late Nipsey Hussle, of all people, raps in her bathroom. And oh my gosh, the first reprise of West Covina, sung in perfect harmony by Paula and Rebecca? This is so important. It tells us that characters other than Rebecca are going to sing. Does this mean Greg will get a song? It tells us that Paula is immediately all in on Rebecca's rash decision to move to West Covina for Josh, and, most importantly, told me that I would be watching every episode of the show until it ended because it was so, so good. You wanna go drive by his house? Number six, season three, episode six, Josh is irrelevant. This episode's discussion will include a mention of suicide. To skip past that, go to this timestamp. 4410. This is the episode that a lot of folks list as their favorite of the entire series, and I completely understand. It's a huge tonal shift. Rebecca's life has been rapidly spiraling downward, and then as she recovers from her suicide attempt and gets a brand new diagnosis, things finally start to make sense in a way that lets her start the long climb back out of rock bottom. I like that the show doesn't tell us there's any right or wrong way to react to a close friend's suicide attempt. Paula becomes completely overbearing, and yes, Dr. Ecopian remarks about that, but nobody shames her. Valencia manages to make the situation all about herself by live-streaming Rebecca's recovery because she's never had a friend like Rebecca and has never had to confront anything like this. Josh thinks it's all about him, and Hector gently suggests otherwise. Heather seems like she's taking it all too casually, but then is the first one willing to chop down the bathroom door with an axe when the gals suspect Rebecca is harming herself. Now let's talk about the music in this episode. 
Gabrielle Ruiz is a delight, and watching her play fake instruments is one of the funniest parts of the show. She shows off her piano skills with the inspiring tune, This Is My Movement, which starts off small, but builds and builds until it's basically bursting out of her as she bears down on the music. Yeah, it's an extended metaphor for pooping, but it's also strangely beautiful and actually fits the tone of the episode well and manages to be funny without being jarring. We need to discuss a diagnosis now. I've never been formally diagnosed with any conditions, mostly due to the inaccessibility of therapists who take health insurance, but that's another story. So I can only imagine the profound relief of finally figuring out an integral part of your life like Rebecca does here. I've seen tons of comments from people either with borderline personality disorder themselves or who work in healthcare who said they were waiting for this episode because they highly suspected Rebecca had BPD. She charges into her handsome new psychiatrist's office, clad in a sunny yellow dress, and so excited to hear which group she belongs to so she can finally find her people. And then is devastated to learn that BPD is a personality disorder, not a curable condition, one that may take a lifetime of work to understand and corral. This song is hopeful, it's beautifully sung, it's even a little bit funny, and it's just so, so perfect. It's one of the show's crowning achievements in songwriting and storytelling. So maybe you're shocked that it didn't even make it into my top five. That's not to say it's not an incredible 45 minutes of TV that's absolutely essential to the plot of the show moving forward. That's just to say there's more incredible stuff to talk about. Number five. Season one, episode 17. Why is Josh in a bad mood? This is my favorite episode of season one for so many reasons. Greg and Rebecca have started hooking up, holding together for a three day stint of just ruining each other. When they re-emerge into society, everybody picks up on this right away, including Josh, who gets upset. One might even say he's angry mad. Josh's little throwback dance out your emotions montage could have been silly, but because it's Vinny Rodriguez III, it's also an awe-inspiring demonstration of his skill with his body, which is built like a brick but moves like a feather. He twirls nunchucks, he performs high kicks, he does flips, and the whole time he keeps up a stream of upset commentary that is just pitch perfect. Highly recommend checking out Vinny performing this live. Another consequence of Rebecca and Greg's hookups is that she develops a urinary tract infection, a common enough occurrence when there has been a lot of, let's say, vigorous and repeated contact with the urethra. Greg is thrilled by this and gets to perform his most upbeat number to date, I Gave You a UTI. Yes, we love brooding Greg, but it's truly a delight to see him have fun here. And you can tell that both Greg the character and Santino the actor are having a blast skating around Rebecca's floor in socked feet and singing into a wooden mixing spoon like a microphone. But the highlight of the episode, and the reason it claims the season one crown for me, is the song Oh My God I Think I Like You. Thus far, we've seen Rebecca go through enormous crests of emotion. But we hardly ever see her deal in smaller, subtler feelings, so the song about catching feels for someone is a lovely surprise. I love the way Rachel Bloom sings this song. Though we know she can belt and even hit operatic high notes, it's a nice change to hear her on something pretty like this. I also adore the way her hair looks during this song. It's all floofed up from romping around with Greg, and there's just something so darling about it. And come on, has there ever, in the history of music, been a song that managed to not only incorporate the phrase spermicidal lubricant, but also do it in a beautiful way? I think not. What has two thumbs and gave you a UTI? This guy. Number 4. Season 4, Episode 17. I'm in love. Fresh off her three dates with Josh, Nathaniel, and Greg, Rebecca turns to Dr. Acopian for some clarity. But it's not really Dr. Acopian, it's the dream ghost, who walks her through three potential futures. Her wedding day with Greg, being pregnant with Nathaniel's baby, and having two kids with Josh. In each, her radiant smile fades as soon as the man exits the room, leaving real Rebecca to desperately ask herself, what's wrong? Why aren't you happy? Throughout the whole series, the question was, who will Rebecca end up with? And now, in the final 45 minutes, she comes to the startling realization that she never stopped to ask, who is Rebecca? To lament this conundrum, she enters into an abstract theater space in her mind where some of her most iconic costumes swirl around her on a revolving platform while she sings 11 o'clock. It's incredible to watch Rebecca's past rush past her as she struggles to understand who she is, but the most incredible thing of all is when Paula asks her what she's doing and she's able to bring Paula into the abstract theatrical space with her and yep, I'm crying. Rebecca is ashamed by the collection of costumes, but Paula immediately notices the beauty, the creativity, the sheer imagination it takes to build the collection, to create imaginary song and dance numbers in order to process something highly emotional. She takes Rebecca's hands, looks into her eyes, and sings the final reprise of West Covina before encouraging Rebecca to take up songwriting. 
Crazy Ex-Girlfriend at its heart is a love story, but not one between Rebecca and any of the guys. It's a love story about the friendship between two women with 20 years of age between them, just like co-creators Aline Brosh McKenna and Rachel Bloom, who wove this into the fabric of the show very intentionally. It's so beautiful and perfect that Paula is the first one to understand, immediately and excitedly, that Rebecca's passion isn't guys, or law, or even pretzels. It's music. There are some parts of this episode that don't land for me, but who cares, because this finale dared to do something I never would have believed a network TV show would do. It didn't end our heroine's story by attaching her to a romantic partner. It tells us, point blank, that romantic love isn't an ending, just part of a story. Even Rebecca's non-romantic love, music, doesn't come easily to her. She struggles to learn piano, and her voice lessons are disastrous. Some people in the room, <coughs> white Josh, aren't entirely supportive, but she sits down at the keyboard anyway and says the six words that Aline and Rachel always knew would end the show. This is a song I wrote. We never hear the song, because love isn't an ending, it's just a continuation. And love doesn't have to be a person, like Dr. Okopian suggested all the way back in season one. Just as Paula, Valencia, and Heather sit around in Rebecca's living room to give her feedback on her music, we've been sitting in on her life, and it's time to let her go. But it's not an ending, it's a beginning. Meet Rebecca. She's the coolest girl in the world. Number 3. Season 3, Episode 4, Josh's Ex-Girlfriend is Crazy. Now this is the stuff. For starters, it's completely tonally different than anything else in the entire series. Rebecca has snapped. She's yelled at all of her allies, fearing that they were trying to stage an intervention, and ran off. Nobody can find her, but she's around, hiding in Josh Chan's bushes, calling him only to breathe heavily down the line, and hanging his teddy bear by its neck in his closet. She also plants evidence on him at work, getting him suspended, and takes his mom out for a seemingly innocent trip to the fair that Josh rightly interprets as kidnapping. If you're paying attention, and even if not, because characters say it out loud in this episode, Rebecca's at rock bottom. We're not cheering for her any longer. Her love story has turned into a horror film. All her friends want to know is that she's alive so they can help her get better. This episode is stunning. The cinematography is incredible. For this episode and this episode only, the camera quality ratchets up and the shots twist and turn with the actors, creating unsettling transitions and zooms. It's genuinely scary a couple of times. The viewer has no idea what's in store for Lourdes at the carnival, and I always get jump scared by Rebecca whacking a tree branch against the side of the house. Josh's goofy guy act is gone by the time he confronts Rebecca before he knows his mother is safe. It's shocking to see him without a jovial grin or at least a look of puzzlement. He's terrified and livid, and he should be. Rebecca's rock bottom isn't even when she nearly literally hits rock bottom by falling into a pit, because, according to the narrative, that's how she should go out. But it would be too easy, too simple, to cast her as an evil villain and then end her life in a dirt pit in a construction zone. No, she has to keep living with the very real consequences of her imagined actions, which drives her into the arms of the last person she should consider sleeping with, Greg's father. All of this leads to the last song of the episode, the end of the movie. It doesn't make sense that Rebecca would kidnap Lourdes, but she did. It's inconceivable that Rebecca's time in West Covina should end like this, but for now, it does. Life doesn't make narrative sense. Thankfully, this is all explained by an extra walking by in the background, who looks and sounds a lot like Josh Groban. But there's a lot to admire here. The show finally lets Rebecca and the audience find out just how low she'll sink, just how unhinged she can get, the bottom of her rock bottom, and it's all done in a completely fresh, expertly filmed, and genuinely freaky way. Never bang your ex-boyfriend's dad. Number 2. Season 2, Episode 13. Can Josh Take a Leap of Faith? This episode is so important to season two, the rest of the show, and, if I might be so dramatic, to television as a whole that I have to rank it second on this list. It's finally time for Rebecca to get married to Josh Chan. Thanks to Nathaniel's ministrations, Rebecca's dad is coming to her wedding, and this is when the big, important messages of the episode come into play. It's also a huge challenge to watch these parts without audibly saying oof or curling your lip, but stick with me. Rebecca sends her absent father an almost identical text to the one she sent Josh when she was first finagling for his attention in West Covina. 
when the dance instructor mistakes Rebecca and her father for a couple, she pulls the same he thinks for a couple. That's so funny, we're not a couple thing that she pulled on Josh back in season one. It doesn't take Dr. Okopian to tell us, although she will later on in the episode, that Rebecca's behavior with her father and her behavior with Josh are mirrors of each other. With each man, she's trying to fill a gaping void in her life that has left her feeling abnormal and estranged. Rebecca's reprise, which sees her covering You Stupid Bitch, I Love My Daughter But Not In A Creepy Way, I'm The Villain In My Own Story, and a snippet of We'll Never Have Problems Again, is gorgeous and brings me to tears every time. Rachel Bloom sings this stirring arrangement so heartbreakingly. Rebecca truly thinks this wedding will change everything. Surely, if she marries the man she's been obsessing over for over a decade, she'll learn to talk nicely to herself. She'll earn her father's love. She'll become the hero in her own story. She'll never have problems again. Naomi is also around, being her usual acerbic self, except we finally learn the important role she played in the seemingly innocent season two theme song's lyrics. Yeah, so Rebecca had an affair with one of her professors at Harvard Law, he dumped her and she set his things, and presumably his house, on fire and was sentenced to a mental facility for her punishment. And her mother protested, She's just a girl in love. She can't be held responsible for her actions. Chills every damn time. Like that text was not meant for Josh, and Josh's ex-girlfriend is crazy, this is one of the brilliant twists that reveal that the crazy ex-girlfriend, who up until now has mostly shown her craziness through quirkiness or wacky hijinks, is stone cold actually crazy. Rachel Bloom gives such a charismatic and convincing performance that she pulls us into the deep end with her, and then, when it's finally revealed how ill she actually is, the lengths that she'll go to, the facility she's been put into, it's too late. We're on her side. But this episode slaps you in the face and asks you if you're sure about that. The final shot of Rebecca swearing she'll get revenge on Josh Chan while surrounded by all of her gal pals, all dressed in dark colors while she wears her white dress, always gives me goosebumps. Number 1. Season 3, Episode 2. To Josh with Love. To start with, this episode includes four full-length songs more than any other episode, and each and every one of them is fantastic. Rebecca is unsatisfied by her petty attempts at revenge against Josh, so she turns to the worst person she knows, a newly invigorated Nathaniel Plimpton III, for help and proposes that he strip away my conscience. In case you didn't already know that Rachel Bloom is the hottest gal to ever walk the earth and eat bagels after 8pm, this song will make sure you know it. The stripping away of her conscience is metaphorical. The stripping away of her clothing is literal, until she's left with nothing but a thong to throw at Nathaniel and taunt. That was just up my butt. This song is saucy, steamy, brilliantly choreographed. I mean, these dancers are so pissed at Nathaniel. Look at this woman's face as she throws Rebecca's shoe at him. Anne has the tightest writing of almost any song. I mean, let me choke on your cock, sure it is. Are you kidding me? Speaking of sexy, the women at the office find out that Tim thinks good old missionary is the best way to please his wife, who apparently gets so excited about their bi-weekly sessions that she heads to the bathroom right afterwards to use her electric toothbrush and comes out with a certain glow. I've never seen a network TV show discuss women's pleasure this plainly before. The characters discuss the orgasm gap and even get to use the word clitoris. Remember way back when I talked about Flooded with Justice, when I said I much preferred Crazy Ex-Girlfriend's other tribute to Les Mis? Well, here it is, an almost note-identical version of Empty Chairs at Empty Tables, The Buzzing from the Bathroom, sung by Tim, who up until now has mostly been relegated to singing Tweet Tweet or backup on tunes like Man Nap. Michael McMillan has a gorgeous tenor, and it's so refreshing to see a male character who, when confronted with the evidence that he hasn't been satisfying his wife, question himself and express real concern about it. Meanwhile, Josh is dealing with the consequences of deciding to become a priest, which is not quite as easy and guilt-absolving as he ignorantly imagined. But for one blissful moment, before he buckles down to do the work, he sings about how much weight has lifted off his shoulders, and now he has his head in the clouds. I've Got My Head in the Clouds allows Vinny Rodriguez III another chance to show off his incredible dancing skills, once again stepping into the tap shoes of old musical theater greats like Gene Kelly for this vintage homage that also happens to be studded with church puns. After the unfortunate mess that was Duh and some more subdued songs for Vinny, it's a blast to see him claim a real showstopper all for himself, and also to see him dance with the Holy Ghost, who, wouldn't you know it, is just a dude draped in a white sheet. And here we go. After everything you made me do that you didn't ask for is the best reprise of all. 
Anyone who doubted that Rachel Bloom could step into the bombastic ballad sphere just as well as Donna Lynn Champlin has to eat their words after she sings the hell out of this fast-paced, syllable-heavy explosion of a number where she finally reveals to a bewildered Josh Chan just all the twisted things she's done for him, including but not limited to running over Anna's cat, whoring herself out of Bean's house, and watching him have sex from not one, but two bathrooms. In Paula's version of the number, Rebecca is allowed to interject at the beginning and point out she never asked for any of this stuff, but Josh is not given space to say a peep here because Rebecca is so driven she wouldn't hear it anyway. And besides, he's had two weeks since the wedding to peep and he hasn't so much as emailed her. Throughout the song, Rebecca, clad in her wedding dress, stalks after Josh down the aisle of the church until finally storming out, leaving him alone at the altar, exactly what he did to her at their wedding. It's just one of the many tiny details that make this show so genius. To Josh, with love, is an episode full of banger tunes, important insights about female sexuality, and one rip-roaring reprise, and that's why it's my favorite episode of my favorite show of all time, and number one on this very competitive list.